So we're in our third and final week of the series, Author of Life. And we've been talking about end-of-life issues. We've been talking about euthanasia, assisted suicide, and what we call in Canada, MAID, medical assistance in dying. And there's been many excellent questions, challenging questions that have come in. Thank you for those. And one parishioner a couple weeks ago shared a personal experience of her own, which I'm not going to get into all the details, but I want to share a little bit with you. I've asked her permission. So her aunt had cancer for many years. She had been struggling with uh, surgeries and radiation, chemotherapy, several rounds of it. And finally, she was in the palliative care unit. She had cancer. It had spread to her GI tract, her liver, her bones, her lungs. There was a tumor growing in her leg that actually broke her femur. Now, as an aside, I've heard that breaking your femur is even more painful than childbirth. I've never done either, so I'll I'll let other people debate that one. But needless to say, she was in excruciating pain. And she turned to her niece, our parishioner, at one point and begged her, to go home to find a certain bottle of pills and to bring it back so that she could just end it all. Imagine being in that situation, the the anguish of being there where where there's this, this painful reality. I think they say, you know, the only thing worse than suffering is watching somebody you love suffer and especially when you feel so utterly helpless to do anything about it. And there it is, real. Somebody you love who's saying, I just want to end it all. I just, I just want to go out on my own terms. Those are real feelings. But I guess I want to ask a deeper question that I think is worth reflecting upon. When we use those terms, what do we mean? End it all. Well, what exactly are we ending? Or go out on my own terms. Well, where? Where are we going? And Uh, As always, God has something to say on every single topic, and so I turn to the Book of Wisdom, and I'm not actually talking about the whole Bible, it is a Book of Wisdom, but within the Book of Wisdom, there is one book called, specifically, the Book of Wisdom. And we heard it in our first reading today, and it offers all kinds of beautiful insights about life and death. So I'm going to quote a few passages. Here we go. God did not make death, and he does not delight in the death of the living. For he created all things so that they might exist. So first off, uh, point number one, God didn't make death. He actually, he made life and he loves life. It continues. For God created man for incorruption and made him in the image of his own eternity. But through the devil's envy, death entered the world. So where's death? Where did it come from? Through the devil's envy. Now if you remember back a couple weeks ago, I was talking about uh, this, this passage uh, uh, and this theme of God having absolute dominion over everything. And what does the devil do? He says, actually, God, I don't want you to be in charge. I want to be in charge. That's the definition of sin, this rebellion against God. And sin left unchecked leads to death. Now, one other thing we can learn from this passage God created man for incorruption. God made our souls to be immortal. The very thing that makes me, me, is going to live forever. And so it's true. We can say say it this way. My soul is immortal. I want you to type that online. Uh, I want you to get this point. My soul is immortal. You know, there's aspects of my life, my my physical body, which is wearing out. And let me tell you, ever since I hit 40, Father Alex has been reminding me, he's like, Father Simon, you're in the twilight of life now. You know, you're you're on the back nine. You've got less in front of you than you have behind you. (laughs) And he's probably right. (laughs) But for for me, that may be uh, the reality for my physical body, But my soul is immortal. My soul doesn't have a best before date. We were created in time, but we're going to live forever. I love this line. For righteousness is immortal. The righteous, the good, are going to live forever. Now, you know what else is immortal? 
the unrighteous. Unrighteousness is also going to exist forever. And we're going to basically end up in one of two places. We're going to either rest with God forever in what we call heaven, or we're going to experience uh, separation from God forever in what we call hell. One of two places. So coming back to this issue of end of life, euthanasia, assisted suicide, when we use that expression, I just want to end it all or want to go out on my own terms, yeah, maybe you can end your physical existence, but you can't bring an end to your soul. Or maybe you want to go out from planet Earth, but you're going to end up in one of two places, heaven or hell. And I think it's so important that, uh, that we talk about this. It's so serious. And that's why as your pastor, I'm bringing this up because I care about you and I care about what's going to happen to your immortal soul. Where are you going to end up? Because in truth, made, choosing medical assistance and dying is an act of rebellion against God. It's a grave sin that will have grave consequences. Now, it's a complex subject, and I know that my words are just the beginning of the conversation, and I'm happy to, to continue to discuss this with people who have more questions, who are wrestling with this, but I want you to know this. This is not just theory for me. This is something that I've actually had discussions already with people. They, when somebody's dying, call for the priest, right? Well, I've been in and talked to people who have actually been seriously considering made. And I think of one situation where I went in and the person was, was suffering clearly in anguish. I could see that the, the impact it was having on their spouse. And uh, I was talking with them. And at one point, uh, they said, and I think that they, they knew deep down that there was this question of morality. And they said, well, Father, I'm signed up for maid. And I'd never heard that expression before. I mean, I know what medical assistance in dying is. But what does it mean to be signed up? And they explained, well, we filled out all the paperwork, and basically we can phone them up at any, any time and say, yeah, I'd like to book next Thursday at 9 a.m., and, uh, and they'll come by, and it'll be over in 15 minutes. And I was shocked. Right? I, can't, I can't even book a point of, an appointment with my dentist that easily. And yet here they're talking about taking their own life. And I tried to reason with this person lovingly to explain, hey, this is an act against God. And I don't know what kind of an impact it had. But I've been in similar conversations as well. And what I found is there's some common themes, common misconceptions. And so what I wanted to do is cover five common misconceptions concerning the end of life. You ready for this? All right, here we go. Number one, Misconception number one, medical assistance in dying made is the same as palliative care. That's not true. And, and again, I was talking to this one person who was trying to justify it and saying, well, I remember this one time, my relatives were, I was, it was a relative who was dying and, and they got extra morphine and then they died very peacefully and all of their family was together. That's the same thing as, as made. And it's not. Now, here's why. I'm going to give you a quick crash course in moral theology. you got to remember three words. This is how we evaluate the goodness or the badness of an action. The object, the intention, the circumstance. The object means the act itself, and then the intention. What's the intention of the actor, and then what are the circumstances surrounding it? All right, so uh, the intention in using morphine, and, and many people towards the end, they're in so much pain, we can offer them a little bit extra morphine to manage the pain. And sometimes, as a consequence, it could hasten death. Maybe, maybe by a few hours or something. Well, that's very different than using medical assistance in dying. The goal there is not to manage pain. The goal is to kill another human being. That's the intention. And so it's critical that we evaluate what is the intention uh, when we're approaching these things. Okay, misconception number two. Catholics believe that all suffering is good. Eh. That's not true. The Catholics do not believe that. Suffering is bad, in fact, and, and we heard it. You know, God says, uh, I did not make death, and I do not delight in the death of the living. Like, it's not like God gets a kick out of watching us suffer. However, 
there is suffering in the world. And it's, and it's awful. And I think sometimes we've jumped to this false conclusion because we hear about saints or, or other holy people. They've endured great trials, great suffering. And so we think, you know what? The more suffering, the better. The more I suffer, the holier I will be. We don't actually have to go looking for suffering. But when we suffer, and it's not a question of if, but a question of when, when we suffer, because God is God, he can bring good out of anything. So the Catholic belief is actually that suffering can have value. It can have meaning when we unite it to the suffering of Jesus on the cross. And I know that that in itself could be an entire homily, an entire series, but I just wanted to mention it because I think there's a worldly mindset that all suffering is bad, all suffering should be avoided no matter what. It's useless. Our understanding is not that suffering is good, but when we suffer, God can bring good out of it. When we unite it to his son, Jesus, who suffered, God who suffered with us. Misconception number three, we must do everything possible to sustain human life. This also is not true. Now, God loves life. And praise God, we're living in a time, in a day and an age, where there's so many uh, medical advances, scientific discoveries, inventions. Like, it's great. God loves the fact that there's dialysis machines and, and pacemakers. This is all wonderful. But there are some instances when a person is dying when we're not required to use uh, all medical interventions to keep a person alive indefinitely. So I'm going to quote uh, from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is a summary of, of all our teachings, all our beliefs. It's not exhaustive, but, uh, but it's important. And there's one paragraph here that, uh, that deals with this. So it's a little bit long, but I'm going to read it. Try and bear with me. Here we go. Discontinuing medical procedures that are burdensome, dangerous, extraordinary, or disproportionate to the expected outcome can be legitimate. It is the refusal of overzealous treatment. Here, one does not will to cause death. One's inability to impede it is merely accepted. So again, go back to our moral theology lesson, object, intention, circumstance. The intention is not to cause death, but we're stopping something that's, that's overly zealous, that's over and above, that, that may not even provide help. We're stopping that to allow death to take its natural course. So again, the intention is so important, and the circumstances around that are so essential. I was trying to understand this, and I was talking to a physician about it, and I was more confused at the end of it than before because it's so complex. And, and I think uh, there are some instances where something like a ventilator, right? Uh, it would be considered basic care and necessary for someone. Where in other instances, a ventilator might be extraordinary. So uh, it's, it's so important to understand the circumstances. And one question to ask yourself is, will this medical intervention serve the individual? Okay, number four. Hydration and nutrition are considered extraordinary means. That is not true, at least in most instances. What we're talking about, water and food, this is basic care. It's, it's necessary. I mean, what's going to happen if we stop giving a person who's otherwise healthy water and food? They're going to die, right? They're going to die. If, if I stop giving Father Alex, for example, water and food, I just cut him off. What's going to happen? He's going to cease to exist. Now, I would never do that to him, as it is. The poor guy looks like he's wasting away, like we don't feed him enough. But, but this, is, uh, this is important. Water and hydration, or sorry, hydration and nutrition, even if it's given through intravenous or a feeding tube, this is basic care that needs to be offered. And the one exception is towards the end of life when somebody is dying, if their organs are no longer able to digest food, for example, it could just cause them to be swollen, and it could not help but, but hurt them. It could inflict more undue suffering, at which point it would be appropriate to stop. 
But this is so important, and I want to give you a concrete example of how this has played out uh, in my own life. So uh, Father Bob Bedard, the founder of the Companions of the Cross, I've spoken about him often, uh, he was 79 years old when he went into hospital. Uh, prior to that, he'd been going to the gym three times a week. I mean, this guy was, was in great shape, and uh, he went into hospital, many uh, mysterious conditions, and, and in the early months, some of the medical professionals, now this is 2009, before MAID was legalized in Canada, but there was already some of this thinking. Uh, some of the medical professionals were, were saying, they were coming to us with euphemisms like, you know what, you really need to start thinking about his quality of life. Or it's time to think about letting him go. Or, um, you know, what would he really have wanted? And in essence, what they were saying is, they were, they were trying to pressure us to withdraw hydration and nutrition prematurely so that Father Bob would die. And uh, thankfully, one of the priests, he was acting as the substitute decision maker. It's always important to have somebody in your corner who, if you're not able to make these decisions, they can make them for you, who, who insisted, no, we're not going to withdraw water and food prematurely. And so what happened is that Father Bob ended up living on for quite some time, a total of 33 months, right? I don't know if that's symbolic, the number of years Jesus was on, was on the earth. However, it provided this huge window of time for so much good to happen. It was the early days of my priesthood. I, I was able to, to visit Father Bob often. I, I celebrated Mass with him. He con-celebrated with me from his, from his nursing home. He was... Uh, he was such a delight to be with. Even when he couldn't talk at times, his eyebrows were amazing. They could, he could like make his eyebrows dance, his facial expressions. He had us in, in the splits, like just laughing. It was so beautiful to spend that time with him. And I know of so many others who were able to visit him at this time, including this young seminarian who just joined one month before Father Bob died. His name was Alex Kaladi, and in those first few weeks of seminary, he and his brothers, uh, seminarians, they spent most of their time at Father Bob's bedside. Can you imagine if we had said yes to withdraw food and water prematurely? There's so many people, including Father Alex, who would have never had the chance to visit with someone so remarkable who I believe could one day be a future saint. That's why it's so important that we do offer this basic care. Number five, it is no problem to receive the sacraments before using made. Actually, it's very problematic, and here's why. When somebody is approaching the end, they can receive usually up to three sacraments. So the sacrament of confession and reconciliation, the anointing of the sick, and Holy Communion. At that time, Holy Communion is, is called viaticum. It comes from a couple of Latin words. Via means way. Cum means with. It is this food that is with us on the way. It is this food for the journey, Jesus himself. Now, uh, these other sacraments, reconciliation, anointing the sick, are sacraments of healing. They're, they're about healing our relationship with God. So it doesn't make sense to choose made a very grave sin that will break your relationship with God and potentially jeopardize your salvation. We were asked this question, a poignant question in the digital foyer a couple weeks ago. If I choose made, can I still be forgiven? Will God still forgive me? And the honest answer to that question is, I don't know. But what I do know is, as a priest, I can absolve past sins, but I can't absolve future sins. And so you're putting yourself in a very vulnerable position, rebelling against God, the author of life. Also, it probably wouldn't be appropriate to have a, a Catholic funeral, because that could be a source of scandal, though we would always bury, bury the dead, corporal work of mercy, and uh, I would always offer a private mass for for anyone, regardless of, of circumstances. 
quick review of these five misconceptions. MAID is the same as palliative care. Catholics believe all suffering is good. We must do everything possible to sustain human life. Hydration and nutrition are considered extraordinary means, and it's no problem to receive the sacraments before using MAID. All of those are incorrect, uh, and they're misconceptions. Now, I want to go back to that story I started with, our parishioner and her aunt, who was begging for her pills to end it all. Well, what happened was another cousin came by from Ontario who was a volunteer, in fact, in a palliative care unit. And she took one look at the situation and she started to advocate with the medical staff. She said, could we please reassess her medical condition? Does she have the right balance of meds? And also, somebody needs to assess her psychological state. Is she receiving the proper psychological care uh, for this condition? And you know what happened? Within 48 hours, this aunt was a completely changed person. She was vibrant and engaging with them. She's like, why are you leaving me in this bed? Are you going to leave me here to die? And she literally said to her niece, I don't want to die. As her condition was, was at least balanced for a time, what, what happened was they were able to have some beautiful conversations about the journey ahead. They were able to share stories. They were able to say their goodbyes. And they were present when she took her last breath. And this parishioner said, some of my best memories of my aunt are from those final days with her. I bet she wouldn't trade that for the world. You see, euthanasia, it's not a right. It's not medical care. But I tell you, as a church, what we can do is we can offer genuine care to people right to the end of their lives. God is the author of life. And let's not do anything to cut the story short. We're going to allow him to write the final chapter of our lives. Because when everything is stripped away, it's often the last chapter that's the best chapter. And even if it isn't, our souls are immortal. I tell you what, the sequel is going to be out of this world.